kind of continuing. I wouldn't call it a series. We are going uh, to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We did look, uh, yes, last week at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to continue in that vein and look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This being, of course, Paul's letter, uh, first letter to the people of Thessalonica. So, our, uh, our passage is verses 1 to 8, uh, and it goes like this. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Now, I'm just going to pause there for a moment. Uh, the, the outrageous treatment that Paul had received in, um, in Philippi was that, and you can find this, I believe, in Acts chapter 16, if you go there. Uh, Paul and his companions were in Philippi, and there was this lady there who was demon-possessed. And she, um, this particular demon who possessed her, uh, was of the fortune-telling variety. And so um, the, the people who sort of owned her, um, she, was, she was a slave or employed, we're not exactly sure how that worked out, but the people who owned her um, made a lot of money uh, out of her demon possession demon possession because she would predict the future for people, tell their fortunes, and uh, she would she would make her, her masters lots and lots of money. But when Paul and his companions are there, she follows them around all day, every day, for like three days in a row, saying, these men are prophets of the Most High God. They are telling you the way to salvation, which you'd sort of think was, was, was a good thing in a way, but she was doing it in a very disruptive and not actually very helpful way. Um, demons love to mock and to cause trouble wherever they can. <clears throat> and so at one point Paul gets so annoyed that he, he turns to this woman and commands the demon to come out of her in Jesus' name which, again, you would think is a good thing. However, her employers, her owners, her masters found out about it, and they <laughs> realized that they were going to lose a stink load of money because they lost their fortune teller. And so they were very upset. They went to the government officials. And again, you would think that this wouldn't particularly happen in our society. But the government officials said, yeah, that is trouble. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, they put Paul and Silas and uh, Luke in jail. And uh, there they were in jail being treated quite badly. Um, and then uh, you had an earthquake, a miraculous sort of earthquake happened in the middle of the night. And the chains fell off of every prisoner there. But they all stayed where they were. The jailer came in and saw... Um, that everybody, uh, that the chains had fallen off and so on and was about to kill himself because he realized his life was over for his failings. And then Paul and Silas, they say, no, no, wait, we're all here. And, uh, and the jailer says, wow, why are you all here? He doesn't actually say that, but he says something like it. And then he goes, why, like, what must I do to earn salvation? And so he is saved and so on. But, obviously, it was a pretty interesting time in Philippi for uh, Paul and his companions. And outrageously would be uh, appropriate. So, nonetheless, even in spite of their outrageous treatment in Philippi, Paul reminds the Thessalonians that though he came there, you know, pretty much right after, he, he still had, they still had the courage to tell you the gospel in the face of strong opposition. They didn't stop because they were afraid of a similar persecution or struggle. Four, continuing on. The appeal we make does not 
offspring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. He's not talking about COVID masks, by the way. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we love you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. The word of the Lord. Amen. So there's a couple little phrases um, that we just want to explain for a moment before we get into uh, the meat of the message, as it were. One is this little comment of instead, right at the end, we were uh, of this paragraph, instead we were like young children among you. And that, that may seem a little bit weird, especially when you move to the next paragraph where right, at what, right away it says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Which is it, Paul? Were you like young children or were you like a nursing mother? Mixed metaphors, Paul. Shame on you. <laughs> but the reality is that Paul is saying in this first paragraph, he is saying that they were young children, they were like young children among you in the sense that they were guileless and trusting. Right? They opened up themselves vulnerably to the Thessalonians. They were honest with them in a way that only little children can be. They did not, they did not manipulate, they did not do these things for their own ends or purposes. They were honest and they were vulnerable and they gave of themselves completely and trusting. And so in that light, then the next paragraph actually makes a lot of sense. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, just like a child can be honest and trusting and guileless and selfless in, in some circumstances, so too a, a mother who is nursing her child, naturally she does not do it out of ulterior motives. She does it out of love and generosity and giving and selflessness. And, 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 it, and those two things there in this context are beautifully connected together. The mother and the child. Trusting and giving and selfless and so on. So I just wanted to highlight the meaning there. Because the reality is, is that Paul did something in Thessalonica that we are also called to, and that Jesus himself did. Jesus himself gave of himself honestly and willingly and fully to all people and we can especially see that in his relationship with his disciples. Think about this for a moment. For from what we know, Jesus spent roughly, almost, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with his disciples, or some portion of them for pretty much three years-ish. You know, there were some, uh, some times of difference. There were some times where Jesus went away to be by himself and so on. But he was with those disciples a lot. 
Now, have any of you ever participated in either teaching or learning in an apprenticeship sort of session? Hank, did you ever apprentice anybody as an electrician? No? Yeah? He apprenticed you? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, did, did you two spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week with each other? No? No? What? <laughs> Why not? Right? Um, anybody else do an apprenticeship? No. It's a really cool sort of idea. It's wonderful. Um, and actually, I know that some of you did, although it wouldn't have been called an apprenticeship. Many of you learned from your parents whatever trade you have, like farming for Jim, right? I mean, your, your, your parents, they, they apprenticed you in a lot of ways. Now, you spent 24-7 with them uh, <laughs> for, for a while, right? Um, you know, and Alex, um, did you have any of that sort of apprenticeship? Your parents kind of not really know? Yeah, 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 right? A lot of people learned that way. But Jesus spends 24 hours a day, seven days a week pretty much, with these disciples. And, and the truth be told... These disciples are, they don't seem to be the greatest apprentices on the earth, right? They don't get it. They're frustrating, they are annoying, they are petty, they, they, don't, they just, oh, hey Jesus, who's going to be number one in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> Me, right? Right? They, they, they say, oh, Jesus, are you going to conquer the Romans now? And Jesus says, oh, right? Oh, Jesus, are, are, like, did this man sin in order that he was born blind? Oh, you still haven't gotten it, right? Over and over and over again. So, three years, seven days a week. 24 hours a day, roughly. And yet, Jesus does it. Jesus does it. And, and not only that, of course, but Jesus, the Bible tells us, and we mentioned this at the wedding yesterday, Jesus empties himself, the Bible says, emptied his, empties himself of everything, becoming in very nature a servant. Right? He gives literally until there is nothing left to give. Even his very life. And in a similar manner, Paul, although he is not perfect by any means in the same way that Jesus was perfect, Paul also gives of himself in that same selfless fashion. He gives of himself to the Thessalonians such that now, when they are having some problems that he needs to address and will address a little bit later on in the letter, when they are having some problems, he can legitimately and totally say to them, hey, look, remember who I was when I was with you. I was me. I was open. I was honest. I gave of myself fully and completely. I worked really hard to make sure that I was not a burden to anybody, even though I could have claimed by right the, 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 the support, the financial and other support that an apostle deserves. I worked hard. And I didn't manipulate you, and I didn't do this for my own gain. And he's not saying that so that he can toot his own horn. He's saying it so that he can say to the Thessalonians, look, this is the reality. You know it. I know it. Now you need to listen to me because you are straying and you are having trouble. But in our purposes, for our purposes, that giving, that selfless giving is so important. And so hard. 
a lot of people, a lot of Christians, sort of believe that their faith is something that is personal between God and themselves and that's about it. And so they don't talk about their faith out loud. But nowhere, nowhere in the Gospels or in the Scriptures is that a legitimate course of action. Keeping your faith to yourself is not okay. Now, I don't mean, and, and it doesn't mean that every single one of us is called to be an apostle in the same way that Paul was, nor does it mean that we need to all stop our jobs or whatever we're doing and go out and become a full-time street preacher standing on a soapbox on the corner of Athens saying, Hey, everybody, listen. That's not what the call is for everybody. But the Bible is clear that Jesus will acknowledge those who acknowledge him and he will deny those who deny him. And the Bible is also very clear that selflessness, selfless giving to our neighbor is absolutely key and critical to being a Christ follower. So what does this look like? Well, Paul is clear. It looks like <laughs> it looks like caring for the people around you selflessly as a mother cares for her children. It also looks like Can you move back a slide, David? This seems to have stopped. technology. <laughs> right? Thank you. Uh, it means caring for people just like a mother cares for her children, but it also means being giving of yourself fully and vulnerably and completely. That is hard. That is so hard. As a pastor, I have a tendency, and, and I think this is probably something everybody can identify, I have a tendency to be tempted to present myself as having everything all together. I've got it all good. Right? I've figured out life, and I'm working it and living it well. I don't struggle, I have a tendency to pretend like, I don't struggle with sin in my life, I don't make mistakes, I am smart enough, I'm good enough, I'm successful enough. In other words, I have a tendency to put myself out there as if I am my own Savior. As if I don't really need Jesus in my life every moment of every day. But that's a, that's a dirty lie. I do. I need Jesus every day. Every moment of every day. And so do you. And to pretend anything else is not to be the young child among us. Right? Paul gives of himself in this way, even in the, in, in the, with the threat of strong opposition looming behind him from his experience in Philippi. He gives not from impure motives or out of mistake. He gives what is the truth. And he's careful with that. He does not, he does not go and confront people willy-nilly about things that he thinks might be true. He is making sure that this is true or this is not true. 
We speak as those approved by God with, to be entrusted with the gospel. They didn't use flattery nor put a mask on to cover up. Brothers and sisters, how often and how truly are you and I vulnerable and honest and selfless in our giving of the gospel in both the words that we say and the deeds that we do? Or how often do we hide the gospel as if it's something private between myself and God? Or hide our vulnerabilities and sins as if we never struggle, as if we've got it all together? Or hide our motivations? Or, or even just selfishly stick to ourselves? For me, it is far more often than I would like it to be that I'm on the selfish, self-protecting, not vulnerable, not honest side of things. I know I have so far to go. But brothers and sisters, we also know that God does not leave us on that journey alone. Right? That is part of the gospel that God, that God preached through Paul and his companions. That God does not leave us alone. God began a good work in the Thessalonians and God is going to continue it on. Otherwise, Paul would just wash his hands and say, forget it, I'm not going to write to them because they don't, they're, they're hopeless, they're lost, they're, who needs them? But Paul knows, and we should know too, that God is going to continue to work in us to make us more childlike and more mother-like in this way. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much for Paul's message to the Thessalonians. And for the gift that that is to us. Lord, please help us. Help us, O oh God, to more and more be childlike in this way. To be open, to be vulnerable, to be honest, to give of ourselves selflessly and without guile. And help us, O oh God, to be more like a nursing mother. To also give selflessly, to serve, to help people grow through nurture and through all the good news that you have for us. Help us not, O oh God, to hide away behind walls or masks. Help us not, O oh God, to protect ourselves. But instead, may we, like Paul and his companions, give selflessly to the other. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our song of